everyone. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Frey, Sales Manager at uh, SF Tech. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar titled Design of Combined Footings uh, Using FRP, Fiber Reinforced Polymer Bars. This is one of many uh, webinars that we are holding regularly uh, about different structural elements um, that can be designed with uh, uh, using FRPs. This webinar is going to take, as usual, about 45 to 50 minutes. That leaves us with about 10 to 15 minutes Q&A towards the end. Um, please keep a pen and paper uh, ready with you. Uh, there will be uh, uh, some formulas and math calculations uh, that we will be discussing during the webinar. So it might help you to follow with Dr. Ahmed. So before we start, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Ahmed Salama. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Salama earned his uh, Bachelor's of Engineering and Master's degree uh, in Structural Engineering from University of, Sh of, uh, of uh, Cairo in Egypt. He worked for the Egyptian Ministry of Water and contributed to several projects during his employment there. Some of the projects he contributed um, at is the Al Sharika Bridges project and the Al Ismailiya Canal project. He then came to Quebec, Canada. Uh, after he uh, he got admi admitted to the PhD program at the University of Sherbrooke to continue his studies in the structural engineering uh, under the supervision of Professor Ibrahim Ben Mokran. Uh, he basically specialized in uh, concrete structures that are uh, reinforced with fiber reinforced polymers. Uh, he joined the uh, SF Tech uh, in July 2019 and he worked on several projects uh, during uh, working with us. Um, he has experience in different structures. He worked in telecommunication tower bases, water purification stations, different slab projects, ICF walls, precast walls, precast slabs, you name it. Um, so if you have any questions, if you want to challenge him, pick his mind, he's the right person to do that. So please, as I mentioned, uh, please use the Q&A uh, icon at, uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, the mic is yours. Okay, thanks a lot for this great introduction. Thanks a lot, Rick, for this great introduction. I highly appreciate it. So again, welcome to all of you from different parts of the world and different time zones. This gives me pleasure to see a really good presence here in our webinar. Please stay with us and we all will learn together. Today, we are going to talk about design of combined footings using fiber reinforced polymer bars. In the next slide, I will go through a brief introduction, field applications with FRB bars, design of FRB RC combined footings, and finally, I will give some concluding remarks on the presented slides. In the beginning, I would like to introduce our company, Ceftec. Who are we? Ceftec is a professional entrepreneurial industry in the business of the composite rebar. What do we do and who do we work with? Ceftec is working closely with national and international engineering firms and the government departments in the construction of parking facilities, water treatment plants, and retaining walls as well as other structures. What is our focus? Ceftec is focusing on the market of FRB rebar applications in North America and beyond. Through providing a complete design for new structures reinforced with FRB bars and conducting research and development strategies to ensure continuous improvement of Ceftec products. The question now, what is the composition of FRB materials? As per the microscopic analysis on our right side, FRB materials consists of fiber reinforcement, polymer matrix, and the interface between the fiber and the polymer matrix. FRB bars, FRB materials may be bars or sheets. We are going to use the FRB bars as a creative solution to eliminate a steel corrosion problem while the FRB sheets for strengthening and rehabilitation purposes. In our presentation today, I will focus on FRB bars. What are the types of FRB bars? In the market, we have four main types. Glass FRB, Armid FRB, Carbon FRB. And recently we have a type called Basalt FRB. However, GFRB bars, 
have recently gained a wide acceptance as a practical construction material for new constructions due to their cost effectiveness than other types of FR beams. As we see here, the typical stress strain curve for steel versus FR beam. There is only difference between steel and the FR beam is that FRB are linear up to failure and they exhibit no ductility or yielding. In our company, we are mainly focusing on the production of GFRB materials as straight bars, bent bars, closed loops, and spirals, as well as GFRB shear connectors. In the last 10 years, the FRB rebar have been used successfully in hundreds of bridges, parking lots, tanks, marine structures across Canada and US. FRB materials offer many advantages over the conventional steel bars, like longer service life, improved durability in harsh marine environments, the advantage of corrosion resistance, greater tensile strength than steel, lighter than steel, no corrosion even in harsh chemical environments, Finally, neutrality to electrical and magnetic disturbances. Now I will talk about foundations. Generally, we always hear about two different expressions related to foundation engineering, which are footing and foundation. So what is the difference between footing and foundation? Foundation is the lower portion of the building that transfers the building gravity loads into earth. Foundations are commonly separated into two categories, shallow foundations and deep foundations. While footing is a foundation that is constructed under the build of a wall or a column. The purpose of footing is to distribute the weight of the building over a large area. The term of footing is generally used in conjunction with shallow foundations, not deep ones. Footing is placed directly below the lowest part of the structure it supports. What are the types of footing or shallow foundation? There are many types of footing, as a strip footing, isolated footing, combined footing, strap footing, and raft footing. What is the definition of combined footing? The combined footing are provided to support more than one column or wall. The simplest case for the combined footing is the two column combined footing as we see here on our right side. Combined footing are usually rectangular or trapezoidal Bland shape. The footing shape is governed by the difference in column loads and by dimensional constraints. However, rectangular shape is preferred whenever possible. The reasons of using combined footing. The combined footing is usually used when, number one, exterior column is close to the probability line when the isolated footing is not able to carry the column loads. Number two, two closely spaced columns where an isolated footing cannot be used. Number three, supporting two columns of unequal loads. The selection of concrete dimensions. As in the case of the isolated footing, the bland dimensions are governed by the allowable bearing capacity of the soil. In order to ensure uniform soil pressure under the combined footing, the centroid of the footing area should coincide with the resultant of the column loads location. However, the footing depth is governed by the one-way shear and two-way bunching shear etching. Now I will talk about bearing soil pressure under footing. For footing subjected to concentric loading, the bearing soil pressure is uniform, which is equal to the column load over the footing area. Footing 
may be frequently subjected to eccentric loading resulting from the lateral forces due to wind or earthquake. The moment is developed at the base of the footing will reduce a non-uniform soil pressure that needs to be taken into account, as we see here on our right side. The classical stress equation can be used to determine the soil pressure under the footing. Now I will talk about septic project. The first application we have here is a waffle slab reinforced with GFRB straight and bent bars in Araya project. Another application for casting water breaks using our rebars, as we see here on our right side. Another example here for casting the slab on grade in Nova Scotia, Canada. Finally, we have another grade field application with our GFRB connector in the recast sandwich panels at one of IBM buildings. Design of FRB RC combined footing. It is worth mentioning that several guidelines and codes are available around the world for design of structural elements reinforced with FRB bars. In this slide, we have a design example for a combined footing support a 400 millimeter by 600 millimeter age column near the probability line and 600 by 600 millimeter interior column. The distance between the columns is 6096 millimeter center to center, as we see here on our left side. From the analysis, the dead and drive loads for the exterior and interior column are shown above the elevation, as we see here on our left side. Side. From the geotechnical report, the allowable soil pressure is 240 kilonewton per meter cube. The footing will be covered with 150 millimeter of fell with density of 19 kilo 19 kilonewton per meter cube. The basement floor is 150 millimeter thick and supports a live load of five kilonewton per meter square. The concrete compressive strength equals 40 MBA. GFRB SFT bar number 10 is it chosen as a flexural reinforcing bar for our footing. It is therefore required to design this combined footing for flexure and shear to support the both columns. As per the design codes, CSA 23.3 to the year 2014 and the CSA 806 to the year 2012 were applicable. In order to have a detailed flexural and shear design for our combined footing, including the serviceability limit state HF, the following 11 design steps will be performed in the next slide. We are going to have heavy calculation. I'm advising you to have a paper and to take some notes in order to follow me and ask any questions. The first step is to calculate the design loads in terms of service load and the ultimate loads for each column we have. For service load due to dead load and live load for column C1, we have two load combinations. The first one, is due to dead load. The second one is due to dead load plus live load. Using the same criteria, the service loads of column C2 can be calculated. Here, the load combination number two due to dead load and live load will be considered to determine the footing area. After calculating the service loads, we have to calculate the ultimate loads for column C1 and C2. As bears the National Building Code of Canada and the Canadian Standard 823.3 to the year 2014. According to these codes, we have two different load combinations for column C1. The first one is due to dead load 
The second one is due to dead load plus live load using the assigned load factors from the code. Using the same criteria, the ultimate load of column C2 can be calculated. However, the load combination number two will govern the design. So the second load combination due to ultimate loads from column C1 and C2 will be considered for flexural and shear designs as usual in steel reinforced concrete tooling. Step number two. In this step, we will determine the concrete dimensions in terms of footing area and footing depth. Let us start with the footing area. The chosen service loads will be taken into consideration to calculate the footing area. So the footing area can be calculated by dividing the total service loads from column C1 and C2 by the net bearing capacity of the soil. The net bearing capacity of the soil is simply the allowable bearing capacity minus the cell charge, the weight of the soil fill, the weight of the footing, basement floor over the footing. However, we don't know the height of the footing, so we are going to take the average densities from the soil and the concrete, then multiply the value, the average value, with the height, the total height we have here, and add this to the surcharge. So the Q net will be two, will be 240 kilonewton per meter squared, which is the bearing capacity of the soil minus this term. So Q net will be 200.6 kilonewton per meter squared. Again, the footing area equals the total service load over the net bearing capacity of the soil. As I mentioned earlier, in order to ensure uniform soil pressure distribution under the combined footing, the centroid of the combined footing should coincide with the resultant of the column load location. The resultant of the column load location can be calculated by taking the moment at this point O. So we have here a distance X, which is which represents the resultant location from the age of the footing. So the length of the footing here will be 2x. So the length of the footing will be 700, 7723 millimeter. The width of the footing is simply equal to the footing area over the footing length. We have here B equals 2.51, so I will take B equals 2.55 meter. For calculating the footing depth, the selected ultimate load combinations from the two columns C1 and C2 will be used. First, we are going to calculate the factor the net bearing capacity of the soil using the selected ultimate load combinations from column C1 and the column C2. The factor the net bearing capacity is simply the summation of the ultimate loads from C1 and C2 over the calculated area. So the factor the bearing capacity of the soil will be 268.21 kilonewton per meter square. In the longitudinal direction, the footing is idealized as an inverted beam supported by two columns and subjected to an upward uniform load. The factor of uniform load acting on the footing is equal to the factor of the net bearing capacity acting over the footing work. So WF in the longitudinal direction will be 684 kN per meter run. Then we are going to draw the moment and the shear force diagram in the longitudinal direction using the calculated uniform load on our footing. The factor depending the moment and the shearing force diagram can be drawn as shown on our right side. 
The maximum moment here is 3,263.72 kilonewton meter, which is located at the point of zero shear. Let us know how I determine the point of zero shear location and then the factored maximum moment. The point of zero shear is simply the often load from current T1 over the uniform load value. So here, X node will be 3.09 meter. Then the moment is calculated at the point of zero shear location, which is at 3.09 meter from the centroid of the column T1. The flexural depth can be assumed reasonably based on the experience and then etching. However, we can use this empirical equation, which is based on the bending moment, to get an approximate value for the flexural depth. Then we will check it. So the flexural depth equals 1,314 millimeter. Assume using concrete cover of 75 millimeter. So the final depth will be 1,389 millimeter. I'm going to take the total depth to be 1,400 millimeter. So the final depth for flexure will be 1,325 millimeter. The third step here is to calculate the concrete property. As given, the concrete compressive strength equals 40 MBA. So the elastic modulus equals 4,500 by the square root of the concrete compressive strength. The stress block parameters alpha one and beta one can be calculated using these two equations respectively as a function in the concrete compressive strength. So alpha one and beta one equals 0.79 and 0.87 respectively. In step number four, we will calculate the putting flexural reinforcement for the critical negative and the positive moment sections. For the maximum negative moment we have, which is equal 3,263.72 kilonewton meter, assume using 18 number 10 bears the entire weight of the footing as top bar to resist the maximum negative moment we have. The spacing between bars can be calculated simply by dividing the total width by the number of the bars. Please note here I subtracted two distances of 75 millimeter because the first bar parallel to the footing edge should be placed with at least 75 millimeter cover to allow space for tying and intersecting bars. For checking the maximum spacing between bars, the maximum spacing according to the Canadian standard S806 to the year 2012 is the minimum of three times the footing thickness or 300 millimeter. So S maximum will be 300 millimeter. By comparing the maximum spacing and the chosen one, the selected one is okay. Finally, in this step, I'm going to check the failure mode by comparing the flexural reinforcement ratio with the balanced flexural reinforcement ratio. The flexural reinforcement ratio and the balanced flexural reinforcement ratio can be calculated as follows. By comparing the flexural reinforcement ratio with the balanced one, the section is compression control section, which is the desirable mode of failure according to the Canadian standard TSA S806 to the year 2012. For the maximum positive moment, which is equal 692.53 kilonewton meter, Assume using 15 bars number 10 bears the entire width as bottom bars to resist the maximum positive moment we have. The spacing between bars 
will be calculated using the same criteria as previous. Again, the maximum spacing between bars is 300 millimeter. So the selected spacing is okay. By comparing the flexural reinforcement ratio with the balanced flexural reinforcement ratio, the section is compression controlled section. In order to calculate the flexural reinforcement in the transverse direction, the factor the moment should be calculated first. Let us see how we can do that. The footing in the transverse direction is considered as transverse beam under each column. The transverse beam under each column will be assumed to transmit the load from the longitudinal direction into the column. So the question now, what are the widths of these transverse beams? The widths of each transverse beam will be assumed to extend d over 2 on each side of the column. The actual width here is unimportant because the moments to be transferred are independent of the width of this transverse beam. So under column C1, the width of beam B1 equals 1063 millimeter. And under C2, the width of the beam B2 equals 1925 millimeter while the length of each beam is equal to the width of the footing. These figures here represent the transverse beams under column C1 and C2 in 3D view. Next step is to calculate the factor of uniform load acting on beam B1 and B2. The factor of uniform load acting on the transverse beam B1 is equal to the ultimate column load acting over the length of the beam. Using the same criteria, the factor of load acting on beam B2 can be calculated, which is 1,243 kN per meter round. After calculating the factor of uniform load on beams B1 and B2, we are going to calculate the maximum factor of the moment at the critical section of beams B1 and B2. As we deal before with the isolated footing in the previous session, the critical shear section is located at the column face. So our critical shear section will be located at 975 millimeter from the footing edge. The maximum factor the moment for beam B1 is simply equals WL squared over 2, which is 394 kN. Using the same criteria, the maximum factor of the moment for beam B2 can be calculated. Finally, we will assume the flexural reinforcement ratio, the flexural reinforcement, and then check it in the term of failure mode. For beam B1, Assume using six bars within the banded width, 1,063 millimeter. For beam B2, assume using 11 bars number 10 within the banded width, 1,925 millimeter. The flexural reinforcement ratios for beams B1 and B2 can be calculated as follows. While the balanced flexural reinforcement ratio equals 0.32% as calculated before. By comparing the flexural reinforcement ratio and the balanced one, the section for beams B1 and B2 are compression control section. Now, and after calculating the flexural depths and estimating the reinforcement ratios, for our footing in the transverse and the longitudinal direction. We are going to check the bunching shear capacity for each column. Let us start with the edge column C1. In order to check the bunching capacity of C1, we need to calculate some properties for the critical shear section. The critical shear section is located at distance 
d over 2 from the column faces as bare the sketch on our right side. The side lengths of the bunching shear area B1 and B2 equals 1054.5 millimeter and 1909 millimeter. The bunching shear parameter is simply the summation of the side lengths of the bunching shear area, which finally equals 4018 millimeter. The bunching shear area equals B1 by B2, which is finally equal 2.01 meter square. Now we are going to calculate distance called C. C is the distance from the centroid of the critical shear section to the edge of the critical shear section. So C will be finally equals 277 millimeter. For shear design calculations, we need to calculate the ultimate force for shear and moment acting at the centroid of the critical shear section as follows. So the ultimate bunching shear force acting at the centroid of the critical shear section will be 1,574 kN, while the ultimate moment acting at the centroid of the critical shear section equals 1,075 kN. A portion of this moment that acting at the centroid of the critical shear section is transferred by eccentricity. The fraction of moment transferred by shear eccentricity can be calculated using this equation, which will be equals 0.33. The effective polar moment of inertia of the critical shear area can be calculated using this equation, which is based mainly on bunching shear lenses, bunching shear area lenses, and the average depths. So the effective polar moment of inertia, JC, equals 1.01 .01 by 10 to the power of 12 millimeter to the power of 4. The ultimate bunching shear stress, according to the Canadian standard 23.3, by using the shear stress model, will be equal 0.4 MBA. The ultimate Factor the shear stress is known for us right now. The next step is to compare it with the allowable bunching shear strength to check is it safe or not. The bunching shear strength is the least value, the allowable bunching shear stress is the least value from these three equations. In these equations, we have new terms that should be determined. We have a term called alpha S. Alpha S is a term based on column location. We have here exterior column, so alpha S will be three. Beta C is the ratio between the longer side to the shorter side of the column. So beta C will be 1.5. The average flexural reinforcement ratio in both orthogonal direction will be 0.0036. Lambda one is a factor depend on the concrete Type. We have normal strength concrete, so alpha uh, lambda, sorry, will be equal one. The elastic modulus of the used FRB bar is 65 GB, GBA as given in the design data. 5C, the concrete compressive strength equals 0.65. The concrete compressive strength equals 40 MBA. And finally, the average depth in both orthogonal directions equals 1,309 millimeters. Using these numerical values in the equations below will give us three different values for the allowable bunching shear stress, which ranges from 0.77 to 2.35. Here we should select the least value. So the allowable bunching shear stress is 0.77 MBA. 
by comparing both allowable and ultimate values for the bunching shear stress, the footing is safe and no need for transverse shear reinforcement. Now, and after checking the bunching shear capacity for column for the exterior column C1, let us check the bunching shear capacity for the interior column C2. In order to do that, we need to calculate some properties for the critical shear section. The critical shear section is located at D over two from the column faces, as bears the figure on our right side. The side lenses of the bunching shear area, B1 and B2 equal 1,009, 1,909 millimeter. The bunching shear perimeter is simply the summation of the side lenses of the bunching shear area, which is finally will equal 7,636 millimeter. The bunching shear area is 3.64 meter square. For shear design calculation, we need to calculate the ultimate shear force as the centroid of the critical shear section. So the ultimate shear force acting at the centroid of the critical shear section equal 2,193 kN. The ultimate bunching shear stress due to the ultimate bunching shear force at the centroid of the interior column is simply the ultimate shear force over B naught by D. So Bf will be equal 0.22 MBA. As we did before with the exterior column. The ultimate factor the shear stress for column C2 is known. So we need to compare it with the allowable bunching shear strength to check if it's safe or not. The allowable bunching shear strength is the least from these three equations. So we have some terms in this equation that should be determined, like alpha S is a factor based on the column location. The column location here is interior, so alpha S will be equal four. Beta C equals one. The average flexural reinforcement ratio equals 0.36%. Lambda equals one. EF 65 GBA. Phi C and FC dash are 0.65 and 40 MBA respectively. And finally, the, B, the, the average depth as calculated before 1,309 millimeter. Using these numerical values above in these equations will give us three different values as we see here. The lowest value will be 0.77 MBA. So we should select it. By comparing the allowable and the ultimate values for bunching shear stresses, under the anterior column C2, the footing is safe and no need for transverse shear reinforcement. In this step, we will check the one-way shear in the longitudinal direction. The one-way shear is critical here at distance dv from the interior column face. The distance dv is the maximum of 0.9d and 0.72t. So dv equals 1,193 millimeter. Now I'm going to calculate the shear force and the ultimate moment as the critical shear section as this one. So v ultimate for the one-way shear at distance 1,193 from the face of the column C1 is 1,174 kN. And M ultimate here equals 2,480 kN meter. Now, 
The allowable one-way shear strength due to concrete, according to the Canadian standard S806 for the year 2012, can be calculated using this equation. In this equation, we have some important coefficients affecting the one-way shear. Km is a coefficient taking into account the effect of moment at critical shear section. Kr is a coefficient taking into account the effect of reinforcement rigidity. Ks is a coefficient taking into account the effect of member size. And finally, Ka is a coefficient taking into account the effect of arch action. So finally, the one-way shear strength equals 1,261 kN. By comparing the allowable and the ultimate values for one-way shear, the footing is safe against one-way shear. Flexural moment capacity. In step number eight, we will check the flexural moment capacity versus the factored moment capacity for the most critical section in our footing, which is the maximum negative moment at the mid band of the longitudinal direction. So M ultimate negative here is 3,263.72 kilonewton meter. The flexural moment capacity as bears the Canadian standard S806 can be calculated using this equation. All variables here in these equations are known or calculated before, except the neutral axis depth C. From equilibrium, we can calculate the, neutral, the value of the neutral axis depth C. So C will be 250 millimeter. Before calculating the footing flexural moment capacity, we need to check the ratio between the neutral axis depth to the effective flexural depth. Here we have C over two equals 0.18 which is greater than this term. So we are okay. The flexural moment capacity equals 14,882 meter. By comparing the flexural moment capacity and the maximum factor the moment, the flexural moment capacity is greater than the maximum factor one. Now I'm going to calculate the cracking moment capacity according to the Canadian standard S806. The cracking moment capacity can be calculated using this equation. By comparing the flexural moment capacity and 1.5 from the cracking moment capacity, the flexural moment capacity exceeds 1.5 the cracking moment capacity and satisfies the minimum reinforcement condition mentioned in the Canadian standard S806 to the year 2012. As I mentioned in the previous session, and again, to have a successful design for our combined footing or for any structural element reinforced with FRB bars, we should check the serviceability limit state. In order to do that, we have to check. The first check here is the check for the maximum stress and the strain in the FRB bar under full service load. The maximum stress of the FRB bar under full service load can be calculated using this equation. It should be noted that the maximum stress of the FRB bar should be less than or equal 25% of the FRB bar ultimate strength. All factors in this equation are known, except the service moment and the factor K. Now I'm going to calculate the moment under full service load. As I mentioned in the previous slide, and at the beginning of this presentation, the footing in the longitudinal direction is idealized 
as an inverted beam supported by two counts and subjected to an upward uniform load. The surface uniform load acting on the footing is equal to the net bearing capacity due to surface load from columns C1 and C2 acting over the footing width. So the W surface here in the longitudinal direction equals 504 kilonewton per meter. Then we can draw the moment in the longitudinal direction using this load. So the maximum surface moment is 2,405, which is located at the point of zero shear. Here I determine the point of zero shear. As we see here, I determined X node, and then I calculated the maximum moment there. The factor K is simply calculated from this equation, which depended on the modular ratio and the flexural reinforcement ratio. The modular ratio is simply the ratio between the elastic modulus of the reinforcing bar to the elastic modulus of the concrete. The flexural reinforcement ratio is 0.44%. So rho F by NF equals 0.01. And finally, K equals 0.132. Now we are going to calculate the maximum stress in the bar under full service load. The maximum stress in the bar under full service load equals 129 MBA, which is less than 25% of the ultimate strength in the FRB bar. We check the stress right now, and the elastic modulus is known for us. So we can estimate the maximum strain in the used GFRB bar as follows. So when the maximum strain exceeds 0 0.0015, we need to check the crack width parameter. The crack width parameter can be calculated using this equation according to the Canadian standard S806 to the year 2012. The final value of the factor Z equals 28,30500 Newton per millimeter, which is less than 38,000 Newton per millimeter, the term by the Canadian standard CSA S806. Finally, we are going to draw the flexural reinforcement for the designed footing. Let us start with the longitudinal direction. As we see here in the top of our right side, the bending moment diagram is shown for us. As per our design, the top reinforcement to cover the negative moment is 18 number 10 bear the entire width of the footing. However, 15 bars number 10 were selected to cover the positive moment, bear the entire width of the footing. Let us go with the transverse direction. As we agree, the footing in the transverse direction is considered as transverse beam under each column. So six bars number 10 will be used to reinforce the beam B1 within the banded width of 1063 millimeter. So we have one bar number 10 every 183 millimeter. However, 11 bars number 10 will be used to reinforce the beam B2 under column C2 within the beam width of 1,925. So we have here one bar number 10 every 1,000, every 178 millimeter. The minimum reinforcement of five bars number 10. Bare meter will be placed as a bottom reinforcement in the rest bars between the beams B1 and B2. 
On the other hand, five bars number 10 as a minimum reinforcement will be used as top reinforcement in the transverse direction. So congratulations, we completed the drawing of the reinforcement details and finished everything. Based on the presented slides, I'm going to give some concluding remarks. Number one. SFT bar is a very good solution to reinforce concrete infrastructures located in harsh environments. FRB bars have been successfully used in hundreds of bridges, parking garages, pavement, piles, foundations across Canada and US. The stress under the combined footing should be uniform stress, where the footing centroid coincide with the resultant location of the acting column loads. Number four, the combined footing must comply with the flexural and the shear provisions according to the Canadian standard S806 for FRB structural elements. Due to the lower modulus of elasticity of the FRB bars, crack wedges govern the flexural design of our footing. The thickness of the combined footing is commonly governed by the two-way shear and one-way shear strength, as we did in our example. Thank you so much for continuing with me till the end of the presentation.